That was so beautiful. I don't think I've ever heard that sung in Japanese before, but you did a really great job. Thank you. Okay, today I'm going to finish up the series on creation versus evolution. There's probably so many sermons I could make on this that I've not even scratched the surface, but enough's enough. We're going to talk about if life can come from dead chemicals. Does life come from the non-living? That's what evolution has to, you, has to have you believe if you believe in evolution. Many, it's not just a few, many bright scientists assume life came from non-living chemicals. But this only happened once in the universe. They will tell you that. That's part of the philosophy of, it, of evolution. They say that everything alive, whether plant, animal, came from a first single cell. One little cell. Everything came from it. Like I've always referred to it, it's the goo to you philosophy. You went from goo, now you're you. That is a humanist religious belief. It's not a scientific fact. It's not provable, testable, repeatable. It's a religious belief that the first cell become the ancestor of the entire plant and animal kingdom. But we have a problem with that with some other scientists. No, not just the Christian scientists, but the scientists of the biological sciences. There's a law, scientific law, called the law of biogenesis. It states that life comes from life. Anything that is alive came from something that was alive. It states that life does not come from dead chemicals. So here we got one group of scientists, some of them may not be believers in Christ, arguing against another group, and somehow all this evolution stuff got put in our schools. It's in our curriculum. It's what I was taught. It's what you were taught. It's what most of us were taught. Most are still being taught that. I've heard Christians talking about how the oil comes from dead dinosaurs. I've heard Christians talking about things that are evolution. The people who advocate evolution ignore this part of the sciences. Why do they assume this? Here is the rationale. Because we are here and alive so it had to happen at least once since there is no creator God. When you take creator God out of the picture, you have nothing left but evolution. That's it. If you take creator God out, you have to come up with things. They did some statistics on this, some, some um, odds of this happening. And I've seen different numbers, but it would contain an endless amount of zeros, and it makes it a complete impossibility when they extrapolate this. There aren't enough electrons in the universe to generate, by chance, a single living cell. Not, not enough. Yet the scientists refuse to believe that God is here. We can't be here because God made us and put us here. We're here because of whatever. Without a belief in God, this is the only option that people have. Is that a purposeless, mindless evolution of non-living chemicals over eons of time into a living cell and ultimately into man. That's what they say. That's what they want you to believe. For the last 150 years since all this nonsense started, some of the most brilliant scientists have tried to convert non-living chemicals into something that was reproducible life. Trying to make something alive out of something dead. Just a cell. One cell. But a cell is a lot more complicated than you give it credit for. Dr. Leon Long of the Department of um, Geological Sciences writes 
and he's an evolutionist. That's his belief. He says, among the first organisms were the lowly bacteria and blue-green algae. They are about as simple and self-sufficient cell can be. But it's not real simple. A bacterium can manufacture, I didn't know this, three to six thousand compounds at a rate of about one million reactions per second. <laughs> three to six thousand compounds at a million per second. That's a bacteria. A cell of bacteria in blue-green algae contains just a single molecule of DNA. They lack a well-defined internal structure, such as a nucleus, chromosomes, or internal membranes. That's why scientists claim that it only happened once, because we can't make it happen again. In the best labs in the world, we can't make that happen. According to Dr. Long, the simplest forms of life can perform one million reactions per second. That's the simple stuff. Can you imagine what it took to create you? If my cells, if parts of my cells can do a million things in a second, <laughs> man, I wish my memory would be that good. But God created all of this. Anything that complex has to have a designer. Cannot be an accident of nature. Has to have our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we're told. Science don't talk much about evolution of the uh, cell membrane. The membrane of a cell is interesting. It's the outside, it's just the wall, the skin of a cell. And it permits specific concentrations of certain chemicals and solutions in and out of a cell. If the concentrations of some of these chemicals vary by one one hundredth of a percent, they will die. The cell will die. So, a super small spot somewhere in the vast universe, how do these chemicals all get together in the correct configuration and concentrations and at the same instant? How did they happen so they could get into this cell and make it alive? These scientists argue that that's what happened. The more I look into this subject, the less respect I have for our renowned scientists. How did the cell membrane form around them at just the right moment, providing these specific concentrations without killing the cell? How could all this somehow just know how to reproduce itself again to make two cells and three cells and four cells? All assumptions are by godless men. But here's what the God of the Bible says. He said he created, created, created. His creation defines the speculations of these evolutionists. What he made demands a designer. This church was built by designers. Someone grew out the plans for it. Someone put up the foundation for it. Somebody built the walls, installed the windows and doors. Somebody did that. It didn't just come together because of randomness. It just defies my ability to understand how people can't see that. The creation demands fully functional life from the beginning. Biology acknowledges that the most a well-proven law, the law of the biogenesis, life generates life. If something is alive, it's because something else produced it. But it has to be producible and in a mature form for it to reproduce. The Bible tells us the living God is the creator of life. That agrees with everything we see in biology. Life comes from life. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's where we get our life. We get it through Jesus Christ. Evolutionary chemical scientists construct laboratory experiments. They attempt to show, they attempt to show that how life can begin without God, but they fail. They can't do it. 
Every attempt has failed. They're trying to prove an unprovable hypothesis. But get this, there's seven unknown methods. Again, this is in their code. Number one, unknown chemicals in the ancient past, by number two, by unknown processes which no longer exist, produced, number three, unknown life forms which are not to be found but thought, um, but through, number four, unknown reproduction methods spawn new life in number five, unknown atmospheric composition in six, unknown uh, ocean complex, number seven, at an unknown time and place. Those are the seven unknowns of evolution. If you could prove any one of them, any one of those seven, if you could prove it, reproduce it, make it happen, you would be the richest person in my life, but probably in the world. You, you would get fame and glory. All you got to do is prove one of those facts that they take as gospel. A personal God creates life. The atheist evolutionists say there is no God, no higher power, no designer, no person behind the beginning of life. It was impersonal, no person, therefore mindless, plus time, plus random chance, and no and or one, no one plus nothing equals everything. So we go from nothing to everything without a creator. Randomly. Our God is worthy to receive honor and glory and praise. We find in Revelation 4.11. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. We can trust God and his word. The Bible tells us there's nothing too difficult for God. You may look at things in your life today that are difficult. We all have those. But there's nothing too difficult for God. We studied Job this morning again in Sunday school. I hope and pray that no one ever suffers any amount of degree of suffering that Job suffered. But yet, he endured. Nothing's too difficult for God. Jeremiah 32, 17. O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Jeremiah 32, 27. I am the Lord, the God of all peoples of this world. Is anything too hard for me? It is... He is God of the impossible. Luke 1, 37. For the word of God will never fail. You can trust the word of God. It will never fail. You may not understand it. You may not fully comprehend it. I learn all the time. Talk this morning about things that I have to learn and keep learning. And it's good. We want to learn. The more you get into God's word, the more you get to understanding God's word, the better off you are as a witness. Anybody in here, can you tell me what an electron is? Well, I mean, they're flowing all through these things. I mean, it's lights, everything else, electric. But have you ever seen an electron? No. One of the greatest scientists of the space age, Dr. Warner Van Braun, he made this statement. I do not know if this man was a Christian or not. Uh, looking at his past, it's doubtful, but I don't know. One cannot, but he's a great scientist. He's, he's what, why we have a space program. One cannot be exposed to the law and order of the universe without concluding that there must be a design and a purpose behind it all. He concludes that there's a designer for the universe. He doesn't buy into the evolution. I didn't say he was a Christian. I do not know what the man's beliefs were. The better we understand the complexities of the universe, the more reason we have to look at the marvelous design that God put into it, at the way things operate, the way things go together, the order of the universe. This order did not come out of disorder, did not come out of some explosion. Explosions tear apart. God breathed life into it. To be forced to believe only one conclusion, that everything in the universe happened by choice, by chance, would violate the very objectivity of science. 
okay, we're scientists, but we believe this and there's no other source. This is it. We can't test it, prove it, reproduce it, but this, this is it. Could the random process make the human eye, the human brain, the human heart? Could a random process create who you are? The evolutionists challenge science to prove the existence of God. But let me ask you, do we need to light a candle to see the sun? We don't need to prove God's existence. God's already proven that. They say their biggest problem is they can't visualize a designer. They can't visualize a God so powerful he can do all this. They can't visualize this happening. But when you ask them, can you visualize an electron, they go, well, no. Well, yes. And they, I say, well, what rational makes phys uh, physics except the inconceivable is real? They say they can see it, understand it, because of seeing what it does. Seeing the lights that we're in here now. Hearing my voice amplified. Recording the sermon. And they say, yes, we believe in electrons. If you ask them if they've ever seen one, they'll say no. Scientists believe in electrons because of what they see. Well, friends, we do not see God. I've not seen God's face. Man cannot look upon God's face right now. One day we'll look upon God's face for eternity. But we do see him in everything he has made in creation. I see God's hand in everything. We look at the heavens. Scientists, when they look at these stars, then they look at the smallest atoms. But they still do not honor God, their creator, and give thanks to him. They're reduced to foolish speculations, which they've come up with, with the seven unknowns of evolution. Romans 1, 18 through 23. But Romans 1, 18 and 19 says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful and wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. God's made the truth obvious. Romans 1, 22 adds, Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. This is what these intelligent, smart, evolutionary scientists are. They're foolish. Dr. Watson clearly identifies the problem in creation and evolution. It's God. That's the problem. That's what stops them. They can't visualize God. There has to be another explanation because there can't be a God. But Dr. Watson says there's no logically coherent science to support evolution. Even the evolutionist can't support it by science. It's illogical. But yet, they take that route rather than take the God-creator route. He says, a God-creator is just simply too incredible to believe. <laughs> He's going to find out how incredible our God is. He would rather believe in an ideal that has no credible sciences than to believe in Jesus. Harvard uh, professor Richard Lowoten confirmed evolutionist. We are forced by our complete adherence to the natural world. We had to create a set of concepts that provide material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying. More, uh, moreover, that uh, materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. This is an evolutionary scientist. It says it's illogical, but we had to invent this, because we can't let a divine foot in the door. I'm quoting these people. And yet they still hark on evolution. The obvious, it's obvious the issues with Jesus Christ. They just cannot accept. It's counter, uh, counterproductive, counterintuitive, and mystifying. Even if all the data, here's, here's the rest of the statement, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, 
Now this is him again, Dr. Watson. Even if all the data, which I believe he knows it does, points to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis ex is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. We exclude it. We reject it. All the evidence says there's a God creator, but no. We reject it. We're reduced to being fools. Babbling, babbling, empty shells. Psalms 19.1. Uh, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. The Bible tells us humanity's deepest need and gives us a prescription to make us whole. It says God saves sinners. I'm one of the saved sinners. Most of you, maybe all of you, probably all of you, are saved sinners. I hope many people watching this video are saved sinners. But if you're not, God saves sinners. Christianity invites scrutiny. We need to stand up and be able to answer for our faith at any time. To do that, we must understand God's word, how God operates. We can't be empty shells. December 2004, I found out, a British philosopher, um, Anthony Flew, he was regarded by many in the world as the world's most acclaimed atheist. You know, that's quite some title. In a world filled with atheists, how would you like to be acclaimed the most atheist? Now, you know, I'll never be exclaimed the most Christian because I fail. But you've got to be pretty good at what you do to be the best atheist ever. But he gave it up and come to theism. We don't know if it's Christianity he come to, but he come to believe in a creator. And one of the reasons cited by Professor Flew was the evidence. He admitted for a long time he had a growing problem of evolution's inability to explain how life began, for that matter, how anything began. And it led him to the inevitable conclusion that it was inadequate in the face of the evidence. So the evidence of God convinced the world's most acclaimed atheist to turn to religion. Again, I don't think it was Christianity, but there are different religions that believe in God, a God or creator. When the DNA um, gnome was um, unraveled, evidence for design become undeniable. These two pieces of evidence, the exe um, existence of life demanding a life source, and the scientific evidence of extreme complex code in the makeup of our DNA were enough for the professor. Those things were enough. It should be enough for everybody. Here's a study that was listed I, I found really good. You go check into a motel without any reservation. You just go, check it out. This will prove, I think, hope. Have you come into your room, your favorite song just happens to be playing. Your favorite song in the whole world is playing. Well, that's cool. As you enter in that room, that music's going, you smell a fragrance that is memory, memorable. It's your favorite familiar fragrance ever. Could be your grandmother cook. Mine would be my grandmother's cooking when I was a kid, because I'd wake up to the smell of that stuff going on, man. It was great. I'd like to smell it again sometime. <laughs> Next you see a basket of fruit. Has all your favorite fruit in it. So you got your music, the scent, your fruit. And you didn't book the room. You just picked it. Wow. That's getting to be some coincidental things. But on the wall, there's artwork that is your favorite artwork. 
It's there. Even has a mini bar. Ah, uh, before you get too happy. It has your favorite chocolate next to your favorite soft drink. Wow. So I got my music, I got my scent, I got my fruit. Wow, got my art. Now I got my chocolate and my soft drink. It appears somebody knew that I was coming. Would it not? Do you think that could happen by accident? The answer is no. And by the way, Dr. Flew is the one that came up with this scenario. He's the one that just put that hypothesis out there. There are just five conditions, music, scent, food, drink, artwork, that indicate that someone designed a room for you. If one takes Flew's analogy and considers not just the conditions that make life possible, but those conditions that make life enjoyable and give us pleasure, we soon discover that this list of design conditions climbs to over 600. So for you to be here right now, happy, surviving, there's at least 600 conditions that had to be met in your life to have you here doing that. For flu, the reasons of so many design conditions become undeniable that there must be a designer. He argues if all it takes is five or so perimeters in a motel room for us to conclude that someone designed it, then what do you do with an entire planet that displays around 600 special conditions? Well, Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes to us by hearing the good news, and the good news comes from someone preaching it. Well, preach on, people. That's just, oh, that's just not my job. That's your job. Actually, my job is to train you to do that. Some of you have been kind of behind in your homework. But we are to preach on, teach the Word of God. Some people feel that acceptance of God is entirely a matter of blind faith. Actually, the scriptures claim that it's the truth is the basis of this faith, Romans 10, 17. Truth is only truth if it's objective truth, and that it is true for everyone regardless of time or circumstances. Thus, God is either true, and there can be objective proof of support of this, or he is not true, and only subjective truth offered as proof. Well, let's go to God's wisdom in 1 Corinthians 1, 21 and 25. In his wisdom, he did not allow man to come to know him through the wisdom of the world. It pleased God to save men from the punishment of their sins through preaching the good news. The preaching sounds foolish. The Jews are looking for someone special to see. The Greek people are looking for the answer in wisdom. But we preach that Christ died on the cross to save them from their sins. These words are hard for the Jews to listen to. The Greek people think it's foolish. Christ is the power and wisdom of God to those who are chosen to be saved from the punishment of, both, uh, of sin for both Jews and Greek. God's plan looks foolish to men, but it's wiser than the best plans of men. God's plan, which may look weak, is stronger than the strongest plans of men. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 talks totally about human wisdom compared to divine wisdom. Some people are so committed to their beliefs, what they believe in. We talked about that this morning. Some people are just so convinced that they're right, everything else is excludable. Well, I'm convinced that God's word is right, so everything that's not God's word is excludable. They claim by a scientific basis for their beliefs, but yet they can't prove it. The problem with all this is a designer, God. They just refuse to accept God. There's a term it's called irreduc irreducible complexity. And it describes a characteristic of a certain complex system uh, when they need all their individual component parts. It's impossible to reduce the complexity of some things. It's impossible to make them similar or simpler and have them work. They need all their parts to function. Professor Michael Bale of Lehigh University coined a term in a seminal work on Darwin's black box, um, 1996. 
He popularized the concept by looking at the common mouse trap. It's a pretty simple little construction. But he says you can't take a single part out. You can't reduce it. It's got five integral parts. A catch, a spring, a hammer, a holding bar, and a foundation. Take out one. One. It's no longer a mouse trap. It's a collection of parts. The same thing with us. You can take nothing out. God created us. Kind of getting down to my final thoughts on this subject. Ever heard of ribozyme? It's a fragment of an enzyme that is so small, having naturally formed, has been estimated as a billion times a billion of impossibilities. That's, that's pretty high odds. If I said, you have a billion times a billion chance of winning the lottery, you'd get up and go buy a ticket, even if you're anti-lottery. If I told you you had a billion times a billion chance of never winning it, you wouldn't. I don't buy tickets. I was basically a theist evolutionist. Most of my life I was that way. I learned it early in school. I learned how oil was made. I learned how all the stuff come about and how dinosaurs lived. And I, Most of the time of my life, I was a theist evolutionist. I believe that God created everything. I've always believed that. I learned that early in life when I was a child. I learned that in countless Sunday school classes, Bible studies, sermons by many different people. I never, ever doubt God created everything. I didn't think it mattered much about the when or the how he did it. I didn't think it mattered much. I just accepted that God created it all and how he chose to do it was his business and that one day I'd know. Good news is, this did not condemn me to hell. I did not lose my salvation because of this. But it affected my witness, I found out very graphically. When I was, I told, I think, this story before, but it's so important. When I was seeing my sister who was dying, my niece and her husband got into a discussion. They run a Christian school. They're very, very educated. We got to talk about creation. And um, I said, my first response was, I didn't care. God created it. I don't care how he did it. She kind of looked at me a little disappointed. And uh, I says, I, I don't think it matters. She just simply looked at me and says, Uncle Bob, I wish you would look at this further. That was several years ago. I've spent several years looking at it closer. This isn't something that popped in last week. This is something I've thought about, prayed about, studied on, read on. It affect my witness. I'm convinced that the book of Genesis is 100% accurate as written. I don't have enough faith to believe that something so impossible as evolution could be true. I don't have that much faith. But I have at least faith of a grain of a mustard seed, and that's what God tells me I have to have. I've got that. I believe the evidence of God is in everything I see, hear, touch, is the evidence of God. Isaiah 45, 12. I made the earth, made man upon it. I spread out the heavens with my hands. I put all the stars in their places. God knows the name of every star. We don't even know the numbers of stars, but God knows the names. He knows where they're at. He keeps them in places. The power that exists in our God is so, so mass, massive, I don't know that we'll ever understand it. I just know that we'll are saved by it because he loves us. Now, if you want to believe in evolution and not God, 
you're lost. If you're a theist evolutionist, you're not lost. You're just incorrect. I was incorrect a long time. I don't want to be incorrect anymore. Let's go to the Lord. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this world, this universe. We thank you for your glory and your Son. Father, I pray that my words, as inadequate as they are, as poor as they are, can reinforce that you are the creator, that it can point people, just like it pointed Dr. Flu, to understanding there was a designer. Well, I want people to be pointed to you, God, as the designer, the creator, the salvation. I want people to understand that everything that we are or will be comes because of you. Father, I ask these words not come back void. You said your word never comes back void. I ask that fruit be planted, seeds come mature. I pray that we reap a harvest, Father. I pray all that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.